Good morning, everyone. On behalf of uh, the Seniors College of Nova Scotia, I'd like to welcome you to our lecture today. My name is Barbara Cottrell. Um, I'm very sorry that uh, Mr. Gloge couldn't make it today, but I'm quite thrilled that instead we have Bill Lee to tell us about phytoplankton. Bill is a research scientist emeritus at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography in Dartmouth. He was born in Hong Kong, became a citizen of Canada at the age of 21, and eventually graduated from Dalhousie University with a Doctor of Philosophy. Following that, he did postdoctoral work in Maine and Massachusetts, and then returned to Nova Scotia in 1980 to take up a research position at at the Bedford Institute. Bill's work focuses on the geographic distribution and the long-term time changes in marine phytoplankton communities. His work ranges from the Bedford Basin to the Scotian Shelf, the Labrador Sea, the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, and the Arctic Ocean. And in retirement, Bill expends his energy volunteering for the Seniors College. We are very grateful to you, Bill, today for telling us about plankton and are very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, I apologize once more um, to those who have tuned in expecting to see Gerald Glode. Unfortunately, I will not be telling you about Mi'kmaq history. However, I do want to start my lecture by acknowledging that we are all in Mi'kmaq territory. And for that, uh, I think we are all uh, to be grateful. So my topic is on the Bedford Institute and on plankton ecology. And the reason I wish to do this is because um, the Bedford Institute, uh, not too many years ago, celebrated its 50th year of inception. So that uh, a few years ago, uh, there was a lot of um, celebration amongst the ocean community. And it is part of that enthusiasm and excitement that I would like to share with you today. Let me bring up my slides first. So for those of you who do not live in Halifax or in Nova Scotia, uh, what you are looking at is a shot of the campus of the Bedford Institute of Oceanography. Uh, and for those actually who do live here in Halifax, but have not had a chance to look over the side of the McKay Bridge as you've been crossing the harbor. Um, this is the view that you get. It's a beautiful campus. Um, and it's one that most people do not realize uh, how long a history it's had. As I've said, it started in 1962, so it's had uh, a uh, bit more of a half a century of history. So today I would like to uh, tell you about two sorts of things. The first is what I call the storytelling part. It is part A. I think uh, it may take uh, perhaps up to an hour or perhaps just slightly less than an hour. But this is, uh, I think for most people, uh, going to be the fun part. Uh, there'll be a bit of history on how the BIO was started early in the 60s, uh, a bit of history about the campus itself, and then a bit of history about the oceanographic vessels, and then uh, quite a bit about an expedition of one of the vessels called the CSS Hudson, as it embarked on a uh, circumnavigation of the Americas 
in the 19 in the year 1970. This will be a photo history, so it will be a slideshow. Uh, stay tuned for that. It's uh, it should be interesting for those who dream of faraway places but have never had a chance to go. And then I will end part A by another photo travelogue, another slideshow. It will show you the uh, life and work on a working cruise that biological ocean rovers undertake in modern times. Then after the break, uh, I will go into part B of the talk. It will be about ecological science or biolo biological oceanography. Um, for part B, uh, you do not need any science background uh, to derive uh, you know, some understanding of what I shall say. It will be helpful indeed if uh, you are used to looking at the graphical display of data and information, uh, because I will rely on a lot of graphical displays of large number of data sets. But if you're not accustomed to looking at such displays, don't worry, uh, because I will always come to a bottom line for each slide and tell you what the take home message is for that. And if you don't understand the data, just stay tuned for the bottom line of message. And I think uh, it should work. I will start part B with definitions and descriptions. And then a case study that um, I think illustrates quite well how science works uh, in general using a case study from oceanography. Then I will move into global ocean patterns and then weather and climate in ocean ecosystems. This will be the part where uh, I will show you, in fact, what DFO has been doing in Bedford Basin. Many of you uh, may know, but some may not know that uh, out in Bedford Basin, we have a climate uh, monitoring station for the ocean. And then to wrap it up, uh, I will say a few words uh, about how uh, oceanography is in fact a case study of strategic science done in the public interest. But if all of that does not interest you, I hope that you can at least stay or come back for the very final piece which is part C. I will do a door prize. There will be a draw of a book to be given to a lucky attendee. So if nothing else, come back for that and uh, toss your name into the ring to uh, try and win this door prize. And the door prize will be this book. It's this book I'm holding in my hands. And this will be given away to one lucky attendee. The rules for engagement of the lucky draw, I will reveal at the very end. So you will have to stay tuned for that. But the reason why this book is so important uh, for today's presentation is because it is the commemorative volume published by the Bedford Institute on the occasion of its 50th anniversary. It is called The Voyage of Discovery. And much of the material that I will be presenting today draws on the various chapters uh, taken from this book. Uh, so some of the things I talk about will not be firsthand information to me, but uh, I will be reading passages from this book uh, to accompany the uh, material that I will be presenting. And everything I read will come from this book. The paper that you see to the right of, the, this, uh, of your screen is called Ocean Life. Uh, it is a chapter that uh, I wrote uh, and it uh, is included in this book. And that chapter is called Plankton Ecology at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography from 1962 
until 2012. So that is the title of my presentation today. At the launch of this book in 2012, uh, a photo was taken of the four editors there that you see, Don Gordon on the left, Mike Latrimo uh, next to Don, uh, Mike Lewis next to uh, Mich uh, Michelle Latrimo, and then uh, at the extreme right, Dave Nettleship. These are the four persons who edited the book and what a tremendous task they've done. The book is five pounds in weight. It's uh, very heavy and it's coffee table sized with lots of illustrations. So I start now on the history of BIO. Uh, of course, an institute such as the BIO does not come about uh, uh, through the efforts of any one person, but clearly uh, is a team effort. Many people were involved, scientists, politicians, public administrators, uh, and academics. Uh, but one person that had an outstanding and critical role in all of this right from the beginning was William Van Steenberg. William Van Steenberg uh, was born in Ontario. And in the, um, during his career, he became deputy minister of the Department of Mines and Technical Services uh, during the early 60s. And it was during this time uh, that he had this vision of creating an institute in Canada that would house all the marine sciences um, for the benefit of uh, the national effort in oceanography. So under his leadership, um, the Bedford Institute of Oceanography was created, uh, incorporating all the marine scientific disciplines, geology, physics, chemistry, biology, and ocean engineering. And all of these uh, came into fruition in the year 1962. Van Steenberg lives uh, on at BIO uh, in a legacy uh, through one of the buildings, one of the original buildings, which was later named the Van Steenberg building. And these are um, uh, the plaques and the photos that appear in the building today. In the early years, uh, BIO, the organizational structure of BIO was rather simple. It consisted of uh, three directors. Uh, you will see on the left, uh, Dr. Bosco Lankarvich. To those in the seniors college, many of us will know that he is a long-standing member of the Seniors College. So Bosco, if you are listening to this uh, broadcast, welcome. Um, here in 1972, uh, you are here with your colleagues, Dr. Lloyd Dickey uh, of the Marine Ecology Laboratory and Dr. William Ford of the Atlantic Oceanographic Laboratory. Um, if I'm not mistaken, even back then, this meeting of directors was called the Tuesday Club. And it was called the Tuesday Club because it met every week on Tuesday. Um, as time went on, of course, the bureaucracy of the Institute as a federal government agency expanded and included many more people in many more sectors. So the Tuesday Club uh, eventually gave way to something called the uh, BIO Science Directors Management Committee, uh, a name that uh, um, is perhaps less charming than the original name. But nevertheless, uh, it all started with this group of people here. In 1965, uh, very early in its history, BIO um, had 
already a program in biological oceanography, which is what I shall be talking about today. But this page was taken from the annual review of the report of BIO of 1965. You will see that in the appendix that lists the staff who were working at the Institute at that time. This was, I think, the first time since uh, the inception of the Institute that a section was devoted uh, to biological oceanography. Underneath, you will see one, two, three, four, five, six names of permanent staff and then some, some summer students. But uh, at that time, there were only two staff people with PhDs and uh, three, uh, Don Pierre, uh, um, Mark Hodgson, and um, I can't see the other name, uh, Alma Holland. Uh, they were all permanent staff. But that was the, uh, the core of biological oceanographies. And it is in this annual report that we find the foundational statements of what this group is meant to do. Two things. The first of these is the description of pathways and measurements of the amounts and rates of transfer of energy in biological communities. And the second thing is that biological oceanography is to be the study of the structure and degree of organization of the biological system in nature. Now, if none of those things make sense to you and none of those terms mean anything to you, don't worry, it doesn't matter. In fact, later on, I will ask uh, another um, influential person to explain all of these to us uh, by means of a video clip. But don't worry if you don't understand any of those. Uh, it doesn't matter for now. For the history, I'd like to draw your attention to the left side of the screen where I've, I've put a red box. This name, T.C. Platt, Trevor Platt, he will be very important in the story I tell. In 1965, T.C. Platt, Trevor Platt, Trevor as I call him, um, came to the uh, Institute um, holding a master's degree from the University of Toronto. In those early days, in fact, it was very easy to land a job at BIO. In fact, there was such uh, um, a need for oceanographers in Canadian oceanography, uh, the government hired people to come and work and then they were asked to do their PhD degree as they worked here at the Institute. And that in fact was what was happened, that in fact was Trevor's career path. He was hired as a master's full-time staff. He earned his degree in PhD and very soon he was the, came to lead the new section on biological oceanography. And very soon after he arrived, he conducted a study in St. Margaret's Bay um, with those driving uh, um, uh, missions of what biological oceanography is to do. And he published a paper in this influential journal called Nature. It was titled Energy Flow and Species Diversity in a Marine Phytoplankton Bloom. His co-author was Dervasila Subarao, a name that will also reappear in my talk later on. So these were two important early um, contributors to biological oceanography at BIO. And um, as you see, the paper that they published very early on, in fact, set the tone for what was to come later on. And they set the tone uh, in their paper, as I show in this red block off to the lower left-hand corner, in what kinds of things they measured. It's not necessary to know what they measured for the purposes of my talk now, but to only indicate that back even 40 years ago, no, 50 years ago, that they were measuring things that we still measure today, and they still inform us on how ecosystems work. So for those of you who are actually interested, the red box 
lists these variables, phosphate, nitrate, chlorophyll A, the ratio of chlorophyll C to A, cell numbers of phytoplankton, carbon, species diversity, photosynthesis to respiration ratio, the age of the phytoplankton bloom, and K, which stands for the light extinction coefficient. But if none of those matter uh, mean anything to you, once again, don't worry. Um, we can proceed with history without knowing those. So a bit of history about what the campus looked like in the early days and what it looks like today. On the day it opened in 1962, this was what BIO looked like. Two ship, three ships were docked, four, actually four ships were docked at the dock. Uh, the Coast Guard ship, John McDonald, uh, Baffin, Maxwell, and I believe the other one not labeled as Capus Casing. The buildings consisted of three. The main building was uh, one building, um, a north side and the south side called Main. Uh, they were later renamed Van Steenberg and Polaris. And then the uh, lower building by the dock was the depot, uh, later named the Vulcan. This was what it looked like uh, driving up uh, to the main building. In 1974, 22 years later, there has been a, an expansion quite a number of more ships there. I will talk about the ships later, uh, but here we see uh, quite a number of more ships. The main building ha has expanded a bit. The depot has expanded quite a lot. And off to the side, uh, new buildings. Um, the fish laboratory there. And then in 1989, we are almost uh, to the way it looks today, almost, not, but not quite. Uh, much of the main building has expanded greatly. There are uh, several other new buildings, but let me skip right to the way it looks today, or at least it did in 2012. It's not quite what it looks like in 2021, but in 2012, here we are. A lot of ships, some the original, but you will see the jetty has been extended on both the main jetty, it's been extended, jetty extension, and on the side jetty, uh, extended uh, to take small craft harbor um, ships. Uh, the Vulcan is now named the Vulcan. We now have a new building called the Strickland Building. There's the Fish Lab, the Energy Center, which draws uh, cold water in from the basin and, and uh, exchanges uh, for heating purposes. We've got a new laboratory called the Kathy Ellis Laboratory. Uh, there's the Holland Building, the Murray Building. And in fact, the Coast Guard Building is here now, uh, brought over from downtown Dartmouth uh, at, from Parker Street. Um, up on the hill, there's the Marine Communication and Traffic services uh, control center. And up on the upper right-hand corner is CFIA, Canadian Food Inspection Agency. That is not DFO, but uh, that is a, another government building. So essentially, this is what it looks like uh, today. Uh, there have been a few changes. Today, um, it looks like that. Um, a lot of buildings, certainly not the way it looked like when it opened in 1962. But looking at these four photos today, um, there's one aspect that you don't see, and it is this. The, enti the entire campus has been fenced in. It's not quite so easy now to get in there. Things changed a lot after 9-11. Um, the uh, foot traffic going into the government buildings obviously was uh, more highly controlled. Uh, but in recent years, uh, and in fact, not so recent, uh, very recently in 2020 and 2021, 
uh, the entire campus has been uh, fenced in um, for further security control. So now a bit about the ships. Um, if you'll excuse me, I need to have my notes, which I forgot. So just hang on for one moment. Sorry about that. I need my notes because as I told you, I need to read from the book that describes these ships. So in the beginning, uh, when BIO opened in 1962, uh, there were already five government ships available for use. None of them, of course, were built uh, for, uh, um, for BIO in, um, because they were built earlier than BIO started. But there were five ships. The first was Acadia. Um, she was built in 1913 in Newcastle upon Tyne in the UK for hydrographic, sur hydrographic surveying. And she was retired from active duty in 1969 and declared a national historic site in 1976. She's now on display at the Maritime Museum of the Atlantic. C and CSS, uh, Acadia, CSS used to be a scientific survey ship. Later, CSS stood for Sci Canadian Scientific Ship. CNAV is Canadian Navy Auxiliary Vessel, Sackville. Um, she was a flower class Corvette and she saw extensive action on convoy duty across the North Atlantic during World War II. In 1951, she was made available for oceanographic vessel, but still operated by the Navy. Um, her last BIO cruise was in 1975, and she was retired from the Navy in 1982. In 1983, she was transferred to the Naval Corvette Trust. Next uh, was... Uh, Two other of the original five, uh, CSS Kappas Casing, originally a minesweeper, served in World War II. Uh, following the war, she uh, did hydrographic work with uh, CHS and then retired in 72. CSS Maxwell, uh, built expressly for inshore hydrographic work. Um, and then uh, later she worked uh, for BIO, but then transferred to Newfoundland and worked uh, for DFO in Newfoundland until 1987. The last of the original five was Baffin, Lloyd's class, class A, class one hull, built as a hydrographic survey vessel, carried six launches and a helicopter. Um, soon after she was commissioned, uh, Apparently she had the misfortune of grounding on Black Rock off Lunenburg. Uh, beginning in 1963, she uh, did oceanographic, general oceanography for BIO, uh, but then she was retired in 1991. So those were the original five. And then in 1963, CSS Hudson was the first vessel to join the BIO fleet uh, built uh, for multidisciplinary oceanographic research. Um, so the dates that you see there are correct. She started in 1963 and for 58 years, she still is at, on active service, amazing. Of course, uh, she has had many rounds of refit. I will talk a lot about the Hudson because she has been the basis for a lot of the uh, work done in biological oceanography. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, she was the proud vessel upon which uh, BIO uh, undertook the so-called Hudson 1970 uh, navigational uh, expedition. So there will be much I will say about that. But to round out the uh, 
history about oceanographic vessels. Now I'm just talking about vessels that have been used mainly for biological oceanography work and uh, oceanographic surveys, because there were a lot of, there have been and are many other vessels for hydrographic surveys, fisheries research, uh, and um, uh, uh, geophysics work. Uh, but to round out the oceanographic survey, here's Dawson and Parazo. These are sister ships. Uh, they are very much alike. Uh, Dawson uh, retired in 91. Parazo actually started life uh, on the West Coast uh, so that uh, the date 1991 was the date that uh, she arrived in DIO from the West Coast. And she worked until 2000. She came in 91 because the Dawson retired in 91. So here is a marvelous shot made in 2008 of the pride of the uh, oceanographic vessel fleet working out of BIO. On the left is the Canadian Coast Guard ship, uh, Louis S. Saint Laurent, much, much bigger than the uh, Canadian Coast Guard ship Hudson on the right, in the same colors. These are Coast Guard col colors. Uh, the entire BIO fleet that was named CSS, uh, the fleet was turned over to the Coast Guard in, 19, in the mid 1980s and all the ships re, were repainted uh, Coast Guard colors. Today, this is what the CSS Hudson looks like. This photograph uh, was taken uh, just Three days ago, when I went back to BIO to take a photo of the Hudson, you will see that she is still docked, but uh, clearly uh, she is way past the prime of her, of her working life. As I said, she has undergone many refits. Um, in fact, there have been times when she was declared uh, not fit for service, but every time she has been uh, refit and got back out to service. So here is the vessel, as I say, now 58 years old, still undertaking uh, work that BIO uh, proudly uh, uh, is proud to show. So for the next little bit, I want to tell you about a very famous expedition conducted in 1970 by the pride of its fleet, the Hudson. And in those days, it was showing CSS colors, all white with a yellow funnel. This was CSS Hudson in 1969 on its way to start the journey. The journey was the Hudson 1970 expedition, November 19, 1969 until October 16, 1970. It was a major Canadian multidisciplinary international oceanographic expedition. A major expedition like this, of course, has many participants. I will not read them all out. They are shown on the screen. Suffice it to say, it was led out of BIO uh, as a BIO initiative, and there were many partners. On the right uh, shows the programs. In other words, what, uh, uh, what kind of science was being done? Uh, there was a lot of science being done, uh, not only one kind of science, so there were many kinds of sciences, all oceanographic, all marine science, of course. Um, well, that includes also marine birds. So uh, avian ecology was part of, of the science done as well. But they all were done from the Hudson platform. It was a multi-leg journey, uh, I think eight or nine legs altogether. It left Halifax 
and came back to Halifax. So it was called the first circumnavigation of the Americas. So here was the first time ever that a single ship made it all the way around the Americas as shown in the cruise track. Something really to be proud of for Canada. So what I'm gonna do now is to run this slideshow, which will take maybe about five or six minutes. I will run it automatically and each slide will show for about seven seconds. There will be a caption as each slide moves along and I will leave it for you to read the caption to know what you are seeing on the slide. But as the slideshow goes, I will read out so that you can hear the, um, the details, not of each slide, but of interesting facets of the cruise. Um, and in fact, what I will do is I will read out to you uh, from the book I showed you, the chapter uh, that deals with the Hudson Symphony, and I will tell you about how this cruise originated. In other words, the history of how this cruise came about, uh, who was involved, what it took to make this cruise happen, and some interesting anecdotes um, of the journey as it rounded the Cape Horn in South America. Um, before I start reading, I want to tell you that uh, the words come from this chapter written by Peter Wads Wadhams. Peter was the youngest and the most junior person on the scientific staff of CS Hudson expedition. He had just graduated from Cambridge University and was taken on as the assistant to the assistant senior scientist to perform general duties, what we might call a gopher. However, he was much more than a gopher. He, he was a real scientist. Uh, he had a PhD, and, but he was only one of the very few people who was on board for all, or mo at least most of the entire voyage for a whole year. And he called it the most formative experience of his life, a most perfect graduate level field course that it is possible to imagine and something that spoils one for the rest of one's life. So I will read now from Wads, Wadhams' chapter, but I will also start the slideshow for you. BIO's ships initially worked in the Arctic seas of Canada, the Denmark Strait, the North Atlantic, out to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and warmer waters of the Gulf Stream and the Caribbean. By 1967, uh, the Atlantic Oceanographic Lab wished to extend its horizons and said man, who was head of physical oceanography, thought that it would be worthwhile to measure the great eastward flow of water through Drake Passage, which had not yet been monitored successfully by any oceanographic group. Legend has it that it was this idea that evolved into a circumnavigation plan in the lounge of the CS at Hudson, while the Hudson was storm bound off the east coast of Greenland in February, 1967. Cedric Mann, along with William Ford, who was director of BIO, and the ship's captain, Captain David Butler, were wedged together against the role of the ship. Mann introduced his Drake Passage idea. The captain topped this by saying that he would like to take the Hudson through the Northwest Passage up in the Canadian Arctic. Ford had already uh, known that Canadian geophysicists wanted to work off the Queen Charlotte Islands on the Pacific coast, where he thought there was to be a triple junction. That is a place where three of the moving earth plates made up the earth's crust come together. And he also knew that there was a need to study 
the unknown Beaufort Sea in the Western Arctic, which even then was believed to have offshore oil potential. The Beaufort Sea is accessible from the west around the north of Alaska early in the summer, while the Northwest Passage is not open until later in the summer. Finally, Bill Ford also knew that the fjord oceanographers at UBC would love to be able to study the, li the little known fjords of Chile and compare them with their BC counterparts. So the three of them said, why not combine all of these ideas into one sequential expedition? At this point, I'm gonna stop the slides right there because uh, the slides are showing leg three going between um, Chile and Argentina. And I want to stop here because I want to read you the anecdotes um, from this part of the leg. And then I will come back to more the interesting part of how this expedition started. So as I play the slides from this leg of the journey, I will read the relevant section from Buenos Aires to Punta Arenas. So from Buenos Aires, uh, the Hudson sailed southward toward Magellan Strait, but was forbidden by Argentina from doing research in these areas that were claimed to be Argentinian coastal shelf, a, hydro, a hydrographic officer, Lieutenant Roberto Ribaudi, was put aboard to enforce this claim. And therefore there was no oceanographic research done during the southbound tra transit in Argentinian waters. Later, the Argentinian hydrographer was felt to be a problem with the Chilean authorities who in who insisted that he was a spy and that therefore the Hunsad could not return to Punta Arenas through the Beagle Channel since the so-called spy might inspect their defenses. So at that time, there was a boundary dispute in the Beagle Channel between Chile and Argentina, which was later settled by the Pope. Therefore, the Hudson had to sail through La Mer Strait back up the east coast of Tierra del Fuego and entered Magellan Strait at the Eastern end. Go so back now to the uh, business about how this cruise started. So the Hudson plan was put forward to the government bureaucracy. The cost of the expedition, however, was far greater than could be afforded by, afforded by BIO itself. The shortfall, although, was very modest by today's standards. It was only a mere $25,000 for the extra fuel needed to undertake this journey. So Bill Ford had to take the proposal to Ottawa. In fact, to Minister Green, who was Minister, Minister Joe Green, Minister of the Department of Energy, Mines and Resources. Green actually had just rejected some science proposals for a telescope and a linear accelerator each of which would have cost $100 million. And therefore he found that the Hudson proposal was attractive and cheap to support. He was due to announce the approval of this project in the House of Commons in November, 1968. But then unfortunately he suffered a heart attack the day before. So the planning for the Hudson Seminary voyage had to stop until he recovered. It was only later in February, 1969, that he was able to address the House of Commons. But then he received enthusiastic support from the, op from the opposition parties. And this was what they said. The opposition party said, this is the sort of thing that Canada should be doing in the world. So the voyage was approved. 
So that was Hudson Seminary. Let me now turn to the most interesting part of the science in Hudson Seminary from my point of view, from the biological oceanography point of view. In Hudson Seminary, they did particle counting. And this picture shows the particle counter that they were working. I will show you home video footage, very rare, of uh, the work they undertook in particle counting. There is no sound to this. And the video quality is very, very poor. It was home video. But just watch it, uh, just for historical sake. This is how they sampled for the plankton back in those days with a bucket off the stern. It's technically called a bucket sample. <laughs> they poured the water into a carboy. Then make sure the carboy is filled. There was 20 liters of water in that. They walk in to the laboratory and they prepare the water sample take the water from the carboy, bring it up to their particle counter, make sure all the controls are set, press the button, and things were recorded on a strip chart recorder, but sometimes the strip chart recorder did not work, so you got to pound on it, make sure it works by hitting on it, and Make sure the water is stirred and you have a good sample. So bucket sampling off uh, the stern on a rope, of course, is very cheap, but we will show you later how it's done in modern times. So particle counting, as I said, uh, was started way back then. But in 2010, I have not seen this, but apparently you can get a culture counter, a handheld version now. I have not seen this, but this is what microfabrication can let you do. So uh, this is the state of technological progress. What they did back in 1970, you can now do on the palm of your hand. This is... So evolving from that, uh, we have carried on particle counting at BIO, but these days we do it with laser activated fluorescence. Uh, this was the big machine that we had uh, for a few years. Then we went to a benchtop machine and we bought ourselves another benchtop machine. So all of these do particle counting for us. Um, I actually don't have time to show this right now. I'll come back to it if I do later on in the talk, um, but it's interesting data from particle counting. What I really want to do is come to this slide. Uh, this is a slideshow. I think it will take five or six minutes. I wanna show this. Uh, as before, each slide will last for about five or six seconds. There will be a caption on each slide for you to read so you'll know what is being shown. Unlike the previous slideshow, I will not do a voiceover, so I will not talk on this. I will leave you to look at the slides for yourself, watch the caption, and also listen to the music if you want. If you, if you do not like the music, mute your microphone so you don't have to listen to the music. But uh, I will come back in five or six minutes. This is how we do oceanographer today. No longer bucket samples.
I think we'll take a break here. When we come back, I will start on part B, which is to talk about science. So if you came to this lecture only to watch slides and listen to music, um, I hope you will stay around for a bit more because there will be some interesting videos I still want to share. There will be one particular clip that I think uh, you will all enjoy. Um, so stay tuned for part two after the break. And don't forget, right at the end, we will have a door prize to be uh, um, selected. So 10 minute break, please. Welcome back. Now I'm going to start talking about science. And in particular, biological oceanography. So heading to the fount of all information, Wikipedia. Um, actually, Wikipedia is not too bad. It's uh, because of the way it works, actually uh, errors get corrected uh, eventually. But anyway, uh, it's a good useful starting place when we need to uh, look for definitions. And according to Wikipedia, which I agree with in this case, biological oceanography may also be referred to as ocean ecology. That's the, that's the first uh, highlight here. Work. Yeah. So the first highlight there, biological oceanography may also be referred to as ocean ecology. This is very important because we are not talking about marine biology of, of, of um, animals or plants. We're, we're not talking about physiology per se. Although to understand ecology, one does need biology uh, as a ground. Uh, as grounding information. But the focus is on e ecological relationships. And the main focus of biological oceanography is microorganisms. It's, be uh, it's the reason is because the ocean uh, properties actually are influenced a lot by the metabolic uh, actions of microorganisms. And finally, in this highlight, biological oceanography focuses on the ecosystem with an emphasis on the plankton. So those, those are the highlight points I want to bring up uh, from this definition. And because we have just seen how biological oceanography focuses on the ecology of plankton and microorganisms, uh, I wanna bring up this quote, which says that we uh, as humans have an emotional bias. As one moves down the size spectrum of organisms from the romantic large mammals and birds through nondescript small arthropods on down to protozoans, bacterial and viral species, not only does our concern for diversity and conservation fall away, it even changes sign. So that uh, is a bias we all have, but uh, I'd like to show you just uh, how important ocean microbes are. And I would like to engage David Suzuki to help me explain to you why it is microorganisms in the ocean are so important. Welcome to the nature of things. I'm David Suzuki. There's a vast array of complex organisms that can only be seen with the microscope. We've barely begun to identify and study them. Tonight, we'll look at two groups of microorganisms that are very important to us. When I went to school, um, 
ocean plants were thought to be dominated by diatoms and dinoflagellates, plants which you can see quite easily through a microscope or which you could assemble perhaps 10 on the head of a pin, that sort of dimension. About 10 years ago, the fashion became that perhaps much smaller things, one hundredth of the size of a diatom, small flagellates without solid cell walls, might make up half of the total production of plant material in the ocean. An electron micrograph shows the complex cell structure of one of these minute flagellates. In the last four or five years, we've realized that there is one step smaller. And we now know, as a result of, of work that's, uh, that's been done really in, a very, in, in very recent years, that as much as half of all plant material in the ocean, and sometimes more than half of the total production of plant material in the ocean, comes from bacteria-sized plants that are so small, you have the greatest difficulty in seeing them with a light microscope, and you really need an electron microscope to see them. And they are of the scale of perhaps one million times smaller in volume than the things when I was at university, I was taught, uh, formed the basis of, of plant life in the ocean. The bacterial cell is so small that enlarging it to the size of this electron micrograph is like enlarging a human thumb to be as big as the island of Manhattan. Far too small to be trapped in the finest net, these newly discovered plant cells, known as cyanobacteria, are being studied at the Bedford Institute by Bill Lee on highly specialized equipment. A barely visible stream of water carries the plant bacteria through a laser which stimulates their photosynthetic pigments. Different pigments in the cell will be activated at different wavelengths and provide clues to their complex chemistry. The presence of these minute bacterial plants in such vast quantities has forced oceanographers to change radically their picture of the ocean ecology. So what Dr. Longhurst in that uh, interview referred to uh, is this marine plankton food web. When he told you that he learned only about certain kinds of plankton when he went to school and did not learn about other things, um, it's because the other things had not yet been discovered. But this picture is a, a diagram of the parts of the marine plankton food web uh, in a way that we understand how things work these days. At the top of the food web uh, that is shown here um, are these, um, what are called zooplankton. And in this whole picture, these are the only organisms that are multicellular. In other words, all the other things that you see on this diagram are unicellular. They consist of only one cell. Each organism consists of only one cell. That's everything else uh, that you see that is not circled. The one that I have circled, the zooplankton, is an animal uh, which consists of many cells, like the way that, that we all are. We are all multicellular. But in the ocean, the vast amount of plankton consists of organisms which consists of only one cell. Of course, the, uh, the food web here, as I show here, it goes still up, of course. And what we don't see, of course, are all the fishes, uh, the whales, and everything else in the food web that uh, we normally think of when we think of uh, ocean resources. Uh, this is what you might call the microscopic part of the food web that you cannot see without a microscope. So let me run through how each part of this food web uh, works and looks like. So uh, 
on each succeeding slide, I will have uh, the food web uh, diagram that I've just shown you, but I will show you the red arrow uh, to the part I will talk about. So first, what's called the mesozooplankton, the multicellular animals, they consist of uh, the pictures you see on the main part of the screen. Uh, these are the comb jellies, the sea snails, the, uh, the arrow worms, the, uh, what we call the amphipods, euphosids, copepods, um, and so on. Uh, these are the, um, and included in this uh, would be the krill. Uh, these are the small animals uh, that uh, the fishes and the whales and the birds, uh, these are what they eat. And so th these consist of that part of the food web, which is exported out of the um, um, microbial part. Moving now to what's called the microzooplankton. The microzooplankton are actually the food of the krill or the, the, um, uh, at least part of it. Uh, these uh, microzooplankton consist of things such as radiolarians, foraminifera, uh, and uh, there's one particular one uh, called mesodinium. This guy here, um, this is a very small animal, single cell, uh, but it is special because it contains within it a symbiotic organism. Um, Symbiotic means uh, it lives inside the animal all the time, uh, but does is not uh, eaten by it. But they uh, they are commensal. They they work together, and the reason I bring this up is because this particular organism, Mesodinium, actually causes uh, some of the red tides we see in Bedford Basin and Halifax Harbor uh, in summertime. Um, uh, this one is not toxic. Uh, it does not produce toxins, it just causes water discoloration. Uh, the next one down called nanozooplankton. Uh, um, you will see that uh, these names refer to the size categories. Uh, so the previous one was called microzooplankton. These are called nanozooplankton. And these terms, uh, these prefixes, micro and nano, they refer to the size. Uh, micrometer and nanometer and so on. So these are even smaller uh, than those radiolarians. They are still single cells. Uh, they are all marked uh, with uh, these, what are called flagella. These, these are the whip-like appendages on all of them. Uh, they allow the animals to beat around the water and swim. So they move, they are motile, they can swim. Uh, one of the most interesting named one is called cafeteria, that one, cafeteria. And the reason why it's called that is because when they, it was named, uh, the co-authors uh, were sitting together in a cafeteria and they said, what shall we call it? The next item down in the food web are the bacteria and the archaea. Uh, these are true bacteria. Um, so these are the ones that uh, decompose all the uh, uh, dead stuff that float around in the water. They, um, they also are the uh, parts of the food web that feed the nanozooplankton. You see, they, the bacteria here, are the ones that are the food for the next for the next chain up in the food chain. The bacteria in turn derive their nutrition from what's called DOM and POM. They move up like that. DOM is dissolved organic matter and P is particulate organic matter. So bacteria take in dissolved matter and particulate. What we call egesta. Um, you'll notice that the arrows coming into this box come from everybody else. Everybody else produces DOM. They all come down and end up there. And these, is all, these are all the materials that are egested from uh, the other parts of the food chain. And they are taken up by the bacteria. 
So it's a very efficient uh, way of recycling matter. Then we cannot forget viruses. Who can forget viruses in these days of COVID? But viruses are in the ocean. There are, I hazard a number. I think it's 10 to the power 23 of them in the ocean. Um, there are many of them, but they are, form part of the food chain or the food web as we call them. The viruses act to break down the bacteria and the other parts of the food chain. They in turn lice and they break down and they recycle matter which are then taken up. Then here are the plants. On the right side of this food chain are the plants called the phytoplankton as you see. The arrow now pointing to what is called microphytoplankton are the large ones. These are the diatoms and dinoflagellates. These are the ones that Dr. Longhurst in, in Suzuki's interview uh, told you that these are the ones that he learned about in school. He did not learn about these ones, nanophytoplankton, nor did he learn about picophytoplankton. These are yet to come. These were discovered later. So as a summary of this food chain, we see that there are plants, there are animals, there are bacteria, there are viruses, and all of them are microscopic. You cannot see them with your naked eye. They all feed into animals, the copepods at the top of this food chain, which then feed into the fishes. The picoplankton that I will talk about next uh, are the very, very smallest of real plants. They are plants in exactly the same way that the plants in your garden work. They photosynthesize and convert energy from the sun and feed the rest of the food chain. And I want to tell you a story now about this group of picoplankton, which are the bacteria part of the picoplankton. And in particular, I want to tell you about this entity called Prochlorococcus. It's a case study of how uh, science works. And in particular, for members of SCANS who have taken courses from other instructors, we have all heard about the hypothetical deductive uh, reasoning that one uses for all manner of uh, deduction. We have learned that doctors use it when they see patients. We learned that uh, spies use it when they deal with uh, cognitive processes. Well, hypothetical deduction is also part of the scientific methodology. And the story I want to tell you concerns research that we did at BIO. Um, remember, these, uh, these organisms here were not discovered up until uh, just a few decades ago. And we were part of that discovery here at BIO. Um, my colleague, John Cullen, who works at Dalhousie. Um, he, um, he came to BIO, actually, he started work in Halifax at BIO as a postdoctoral fellow. So even before he started at BIO, he worked with the biological oceanography section as a postdoctoral fellow. And we all went out uh, on a scientific uh, mission and we observed some curious things. In particular, what intrigued John was that there seemed to be a discrepancy in what he could calculate and what he could see. In other words, we, we were able to count phytoplankton. Phytoplankton was counted by this fellow that I had talked about earlier, uh, who was here at BIO right from the beginning, uh, Dr. Subarau. He made some counts of phytoplankton. And so we had those counts, but John Cullen made some calculations based on those counts. And he said, there seems to be a discrepancy. The number I calculate does not match the counts you make. So what's going on? Um, are, did you count them properly or have I miscalculated? 
And both of them said, no, I have not made a mistake. So what is there left? The, what is left is, well, clearly there are some cells that we cannot see. So you have not counted them, but my calculation shows that they ought to be there. So what does this remind you of? It reminds you of how astro astrophysicists work. When they look out into the cosmos and see dark matter, or they infer dark matter, but they can't see them. Well, they know for sure that there's dark matter, but they can't see them. So who's right? In this case, John says, well, there must be dark matter in the ocean. But Subara says, well, I can't see them. So they said, they are invisible to us. So we published a paper on this. We said there are invisible phantoms in the ocean. We took a big step because we didn't know, but we predicted. And so that is part of science. You take a step out and you predict something. Well, it so happens that we predicted the finding in 1983. And a few years later, we actually did see them in 1988. And how did we see them? We did use particle counting. We relied not on human visualization under the microscope because human eyes could not detect such a small organism under a microscope. But we use particle counting of the equipment I showed you before the break. We use laser activated fluorescence uh, uh, cell counter and electronic visualization showed it to us. So in 1988, we published a paper and we found very small red fluorescing cells. This was uh, the way we looked at it. It so happened uh, that our, uh, there was another team uh, at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute in Massachusetts uh, that had been working on the same problem uh, over the same time. And they found the same thing. They used exactly the same technology as we did, laser activated uh, flow counting, and they too saw it. So in the same year, 1988, two papers were published in the open literature, revealing for the first time that the in, in the ocean, there was dark matter which accounted for cells that had previously gone unnoticed. So that is the way science works. You, you, you really have to uh, take a step out and look at it and you know, be a little bold. And I was proud enough of this achievement um, that in fact, uh, we were given award for making discovery. And uh, for this, uh, work was done only because uh, of the very engaging uh, scientific uh, atmosphere that we enjoyed at Bedford Institute that allowed us to undertake this kind of work. So at BIO, we completed part of the marine food web. We, uh, we now realize that there are things in the ocean that human eyes cannot see, but are in fact uh, very important for the food web. So I go back once again to this Wikipedia slide about biological oceanography and um, show you in fact, emphasize to you that in fact, we are dealing with ecology. And what is ecology? Ecology is not environmentalism per se, although it is related, but ecology is an academic scientific discipline that looks at spatial, and temporal patterns of distribution. In other words, where do we find organisms? How are they distributed over space? How do they change over time? How many of them are there? That is abundance. How many of them are there? And what causes them to be there? That is ecology. And this is the marine food web that I talked to you about placed in an ocean context, uh, in an ecosystem context. Here is the food web that I talked about before. There are the large plankton, the small plankton, 
bacteria, the viruses are here somewhere. Uh, yeah, there they are, I think. But we've got the microzooplankton, zooplankton, and then the fish, which I didn't show, but as I told you, they all lead up to the fish. What's important about this slide that I haven't talked about is that it is embedded in an ecosystem context. Ecosystem means everything else around them. So what starts it off? What's around them? Well, the sun, most importantly, because that's what drives the plants. What else? Carbon dioxide. That's what feeds the phytoplankton. What else? The food web, when they die, they sink. So they sink into the ocean. Much of it is degraded by bacteria, so they become CO2. Some of it is eaten by animals down here, and a very, very small proportion ends up in the ocean bottom. And that's what uh, makes your fossil fuels. But here's the carbon cycle, which we're all very interested in now in these days because we know what's happening with CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, CO2 in the atmosphere enters the ocean. A lot of it comes back out because all the animals and plants respire. They give it off again. So what they give off comes out. But the part that sinks also is degraded by bacteria. So they give off CO2. So this is the biology part. And those of you who were at Jim Abraham's talk about ocean and climate, he mentioned about CO2 pumps in the ocean, but he didn't talk about this part, the biological part. All he talked about was the physical part, which is this part here. And here we have what's called the CO2 input and outputs uh, due to physical mechanisms. I won't dwell on that, only to say that biology is fully embedded in the ocean with ocean, uh, chemistry and physics, uh, cycling CO2 uh, from the atmosphere to the ocean, back out to the air, and some of it, small proportion, ends up sequestered in the ocean bottom. Uh, so that is my quick five-minute uh, lesson on uh, carbon dynamics in the ocean. Needless to say, all of this feeds in to ocean climate models, uh, which help uh, understand how to uh, deal with the atmospheric carbon problem. The ocean is a big sink for carbon. Then one step further into our definitions of ecology. In the ocean, what we look at a lot of time is something called macroecology. Macroecology is the subfield of ecology that deals with the study of relationships between organisms and their environment at large spatial scales. And all of this is done so that we can understand the core things we need to address in ecology, namely abundance, distribution, and diversity. How many of them are there? Where can we find them? What different kinds are they? And of course, you know, this ties into evolution because diversity talks about evolution. But this is a subfield of ecology, macroecology. Um, you know, for those of you who think yes, but I also know there's something called macroeconomics and there's macroevolution and there's macro this and that. Yes, this is right. In almost all fields of academic study, you can find subdisciplines that deal with macro issues and micro issues. So for those economists, you know the difference between macroeconomics and microeconomics. It's the same here. We are talking about uh, an overview uh, from the top. So if none of that made sense to you, I wanna show you this very short clip, I think two minutes, two and a half minutes. Um, CBC 22 minutes. Um, this is one of my favorite clips for showing people who do not understand what macroecology is. At the end of it, I'm sure all of you will know what macroecology is.
Understanding our place in the modern world can be difficult and frustrating. Here to help us comprehend our existence is one of the world's foremost philosophers, Tina mm. T. Merton. Mm. Thanks for being here. Yes, well, mm, thank you. These anomalistic microcultural encounters are definitely gamma thought parallel play incubators, excogitating our metaphysical dichotomies. Yet, then sensorial input we perceive as the present is illusory. So, Susan, eternalistically, I'm not actually here. Well, it's great not to have you here. <laughs> You're a lecturer at Burning Man University, and mm -hmm. you've just published your 23rd book. Yes, I have. It's called Biospheric Superabundance, Subsending the Aerologistical, Epistemological, Ontological, Anthropocentrism of Megalopolis Macroecology. <laughs> So... Catchy. Yes. Could you just take a second to explain to our audience what any one of those words mean? Uh, well, you know, it's that uber-ubiquitous grail quest mythos vis-a-vis -vis hyper in the face of cosmotheistic macro-accidentalism. So, you know... <laughs> Okay, but could you say some of that in layman's terms? Oh, well, you raise a valid point, Susan, about the semiotic species being of linguistic anthropological hive mind. Egocentric anti-realism, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally meant to do that. Of course you did. But what my audience wants to know is how to find meaning in the modern world, you know, with its Insta stories, augmented reality, cross-platform personal mm. brand building, and Kardashian-esque mm. influencers. Well, I don't know what those words mean, actually. Oh, so. okay. So an Insta story... I don't want to know, sorry. No, you're, you're probably better off. Okay, well, thanks again to Tina T. Merton for not being with us here tonight. Oh, she's actually not here. Whoa, was she ever here at all? Sorry, I dropped my book. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Tina T. Martin. So if none of those words made sense to you, uh, I'm no further ahead in helping you. <laughs> so here's macroecology as we do it at BIO. Um, each one of those white dots is a place that we have taken water samples from. So it's most of it comes around our own ocean waters around uh, Eastern Canada. Uh, a lot of it comes from the Arctic Ocean that uh, DFO does work in. Some of it has been uh, done in uh, work across the North Atlantic. There have been one or two occasional cruises. Um, one that you see uh, from Halifax down through the Panama Canal and up uh, along the west coast of North America, ending up in Victoria. Uh, there was one that we did in collaboration with uh, a Japanese cruise uh, in the southern hemisphere that went across three oceans. Uh, and there have been, of course, many others uh, in the Labrador Sea and so on. So these are all the places that we have taken water samples from and, and actually many more. But what is important that is that this map shows a false color image in color of the distribution and abundance of chlorophyll A. Now chlorophyll A, or chlorophyll for short, chlorophyll is the plant pigment found in all plants. It's what makes leaves green. If you look out in your garden and you see green leaves, the green is from the chlorophyll A. And so it is in the ocean. All the plants have this universal pigment, chlorophyll. So if we can measure chlorophyll, we know that we've got plants in the water. So this is a global image of chlorophyll distribution in the water. It was done, uh, taken from satellite imagery. Satellite imagery of the ocean chlorophyll field has been available since the mid and late 1970s. So this picture, uh, I can't remember when it was done, but you know, it's, it, it's a good representation. What it shows in color is that areas of deep red, red and orange are places where you find a lot of phytoplankton. 
places that the colors which are green and aquamarine and light blue, they are places where there's chlorophyll, some of it, but not a lot. And then the dark blue, deep blue, and the deep purple are areas of the ocean where there is very little chlorophyll. They are there, but not very much at all. So the impression that I hope that you see is that in all three of the major ocean basins, Indian, Pacific, and Atlantic, uh, in the subtropical regions uh, between 40 degrees south and north, most of the water is ocean desert, very low plants. There are places where there, it's red and yellow, uh, and uh, these are very important places. The idea from this is that we can take that information and make a partition of the entire global ocean into different parts that have common uh, ecological features. So this map, it has a very particular projection shown in, in the cloverleaf projection of the world in the middle. It emphasizes the three oceans. So there are three parts to this projection, the uh, Pacific Indian and Atlantic Ocean. And it emphasizes that the oceans, based on our knowledge of how ocean, uh, biological oceanography distribution works, and also the surface field of phytoplankton distribution, we can assign many, many different, what are called provinces to the ocean, which represent areas and regions where there is a common um, ecological characteristic that distinguishes each from the other. So the large area, which are called biomes, are clearly uh, things that have uh, uh, common characteristics. So we have the polar biomes, the westerly biome, trades biome, and the coastal biomes. But with each one of these four biomes, we have many other provinces. And the work that was done to partition this global ocean was done by my colleague, Dr. Longhurst, who you saw being interviewed by Dr. Suzuki uh, much earlier on this talk. Um, He published his uh, synthesis of the world's global ocean in this book called Ecological Geography of the Sea. And it is based on this very important landmark work that we are able to do the following. In other words, what we have done or what they have done, uh, you'll notice that in this paper published by Longhurst and the uh, other uh, in, uh, people in the biological oceanography, one of whom I've mentioned before, Trevor Platt, they produced this paper, which for the first time in 1995, gave us a very good account of what the global production of phytoplankton is in the entire world's ocean. Because before this, one could only guess and make very uh, uh, rough calculations uh, based on not very good data. But based on this kind of very highly detailed ocean mapping and satellite information and uh, very insightful analytical mathematics, uh, these authors were able to come up with their best estimate of global primary production, which they gave as a value of 50 gigatons carbon per year. And um, you don't have to look at any of these numbers because certainly I can't see them. But the bottom line is for each one of those 57 boxes in that ocean map, they were able to list all their numbers. And in the total number here, they give number of 50. And what is important about this number 50 gigatons? Well, it's the basis upon which all the climate models must take into account. Uh, because this represents the carbon um, uh, production rate of phytoplankton in the ocean every year, um, potentially. Uh, 
I won't say too much further about this because uh, one could construct a, a, a six week course uh, from this kind of consideration, uh, but I'll skip over it uh, quickly now. Uh, so the map of primary production is this. It looks like the map of chlorophyll distribution, but it differs slightly. Actually, it differs quite a lot. Uh, the ocean still has vast areas of low productivity in the subtropical waters, but you will see lots of areas hugging the coast with high production. And of course, places with high production are also the places where you'll find a lot of fish. So, you know, these are the areas of high production here, upwelling zones, which we call. So all of that is a macroecological distribution. So what can we do further from that? Well, as I told you, we started out with all our sampling sites here in the ocean that we've covered. We map those onto this parti global partition of ocean that we now have. And so we can then take all the samples that we have measured from the ocean and look at different species. So these are all different kinds of uh, microbial species or bacteria that we have found in the ocean. And so we, for the first time, have a global distribution of plankton mapped out in each one of these ocean partitions, you know, this one and that one and that one, at least for the ones that we have visited. You know, we have not visited all, vi all the provinces in the world's oceans, but of those that we have, uh, we now understand their distribution. So that is part of ecology, as I told you. Find out how many of them there are and find out where they are. And so what good is that information? Well, it is good for mapping uh, the future distribution of it. So present and future, this is climatology of two of the species, the Prochlorococcus and the Sinococcus. We have global maps of their distribution now. And this was done, of course, uh, with mathematical modeling. With those maps, uh, we can use what's called niche modeling to project future distributions. So in the future, this is what we think we will see. This, this black line is the um, present distribution. This black line here is the present distribution and the red line is the distribution in the year 2100. Climate change scenarios. So we can play climate change scenario games with our present maps. Because we are Canadians, we, we are blessed with a country that has three oceans, the Pacific, the Arctic, and the Atlantic. And here in one snapshot, uh, I will show you a distribution of the kinds of uh, data that we can generate uh, by taking a cruise from two ships, actually, this came from two ship cruises. Uh, one left from Victoria, uh, I think it was Sir Wilfrid Laurier, CSS Laurier. It, did, it made this leg. And then the Louis Saint Laurent made the leg out of Halifax and came along this side. And then we stitched in the data from this side to this side and one made one giant map. And this is what it looks like. Now it is difficult if you are not used to seeing this kind of display, but I will try to explain it in one minute. Here we have the leg coming from Victoria. And here we have the leg coming from Halifax. So crossing from Halifax, we went through Labrador Sea, Davis Strait, Baffin Bay, and so on. And from Victoria, they went through the Aleutians, the Bering Sea, and so on. This is the ocean bottom. So this is the Bering Strait here. And these are the Canadian archipelago islands. And this is just the distance across here. So what we are, and this is ocean depth. So the surface of the ocean is here and this is 400 meters down. The ocean is 
4,000 meters deep here. But the color map is the map of the plankton I want to show you. So in the Pacific Ocean, for this uh, Cynococcus microbe, there were a lot of them, red color. There were a lot of them there. There were some of them over the bearing uh, shelf. There were none, blue, blue means none, or very little, very little in the Canada basin. On our side of the Atlantic, there were some in the Labrador Sea, but once we get into the archipelago, there was none, almost none. Uh, there were uh, some hot spots uh, around the islands there. So I don't want to dwell with this, only to show you that with ocean mapping and ocean sampling, we are now able to describe uh, the distribution of plankton in all of Canada's three oceans. I'll quickly skip through these, I don't need to look at this. So what does all of that give us? It gives us a macroecological pattern in oceanography, which is where I was heading to all this time. When I started telling you about what is biological oceanography, what is ecology, what is macroecology, what is uh, oceanography, it comes down to this, I think. From all of those cruises, from all of those samples, we can distill into a, into a graph such as this. And this is where um, you'll have to pay a, a little bit attention with me because I really want to get this point across to you. What we are seeing here is a chart, is a plot of all the data I've shown you so far, plotted this way. Along the X axis, is plotted uh, the size of the phytoplankton cell. As I told you, each phytoplankton is a single cell. So we have small cells and we have big cells. Well, if the cell is small, it would be plotted down here. And then if we move along, it will be plotted up here. So the, these cells here. On the Y axis is abundance, the number of cells per square meter. So if, a data plot shows up high on the graph. It means there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them here and not so many down here because cell number decreases this way. So what are we seeing? We see all the data falling in a cluster with a slope like that. The slope is this red line. It describes for us the best fit of all the data to a regular pattern. The slope meaning how much does abundance decrease for every one step in size increase do we have? In other words, if, a, if we have made a measurement of small cells and we looked at big cells, well, how many fewer cells are there? Well, it's given us by the slope because the slope is just the ratio of that to that. And the slope is minus seven, eight. So the slope is essentially minus three quarter. And why is that important? It is important. It is a beautiful result because it reveals elegant unity in our living world. What do I mean by that? In phytoplankton, we have discovered this relationship from the oceans, but you can find the same thing in any other part of the living world as well. For here, we have the situation with birds. Here we had the phytoplankton and down there we had the birds. But if you look at any other groups, rodents, mammals, elephants, anything else, you will find that they all fit here with a slope of minus three quarters. It's the plot of how big an organism is versus how many there are. It's a fundamental consideration in ecology. How big are you and how many of you are there? 
And the guiding principle is this, what is called allometric equation, minus three quarter slope. I'll leave that. Time is short, so I'll run quickly through the rest. I wanna show this because it explains clearly a concept I need. And stability of the atmosphere is really important for those of you who are uh, concerned about winds, but certainly those of you who are sailors, because the stability of the air actually contributes to the gustiness of the wind. The stability of the air is essentially the tendency of the air and how, how easy the air at the surface can move vertically through the atmosphere uh, once it's been initially lifted. If, if you recall last week, we talked about um, um, air parcels that are lifted uh, along mountains, uh, air parcels that are lifted along fronts, or air parcels that are simply lifted because of the daytime heating, especially in the summertime, and that very warm, moist air basically rises, and that lifting can contribute to. So Jim Abraham told us about stability of air, but in fact, ocean and air are simply two different fluids. They have different uh, uh, parameters to them, but the principles that make one work are the same for both air and water. And he talked about stability. So this is important uh, parameter here. And we use that in looking at phytoplankton. This is the stability parameter that we use. And so the point I want to tell you is that in the ocean, stability matters just as well. And it is actually a force that shapes the composition of phytoplankton in the ocean. So I'll leave it there for now um, and move on to the other part of the space-time continuum that Tina Merton told us about. Everything I've told you about so far has to do with macroecology over space. But now I wanna spend a few minutes talking about how things change over time. Um, and I wanna ask Jim to tell us about time you. as well. Ian says, when does weather forecasting end and climate change projections take place? In other words, does forecasting have a place in the short term and when does climate change have a role in the longer term? So the boundary between weather and climate is, um, is, a, is, is an interesting question. And the term that's used now is seamless. And so that predictions will become more and more seamless. So that I'll give you a weather forecast and then I'll give you a seasonal outlook and then I'll give you a climate projection for the next 10 years. And it'll be a seamless uh, delivery approach using a seamless modeling system and tools. And so there won't be a boundary between what's weather and what's climate. It'll be basically a seamless prediction of what's happening to our so as Jim explained, weather and climate are more or less the same thing. It depends on the time scale over which you consider it. So the final piece of uh, data I wanna show you comes from our own Bedford Basin because uh, BIO conducts uh, monitoring work in the Bedford Basin. A beautiful spring day. The land is warming up and so is the ocean. You'd think temperature didn't matter to Paul Dickey. He's out here on Bedford Basin every week in the dead of winter or a summer heat wave, taking samples of the water. But in fact, temperature is one of the most important things he's checking. He is just one of the scientists at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography, studying, among other things, how climate relates to ocean ecology. The more information we can get on what's normal, the more easily we'll be able to see what's abnormal. We uh, look at the temperature and the salinity and the, the weather and the phytoplankton that are in the water and the nutrients that the phytoplankton feed on and uh, the bacteria and the viruses and the zooplankton that feeds on the phytoplankton and the fish larvae which feeds on the, uh, the zooplankton. 
This part of Halifax Harbour acts as an ocean microcosm. Life cycles here work the same way they do out at sea. But the basin offers BIO scientists an advantage. It's right outside their laboratories. Paul Dickey says raw sewage in the water from neighboring communities doesn't throw things off. It just gives bacteria more to eat. The test run here gives scientists a look at what's happening in the ocean every week. The data comes in so frequently they're able to track even small changes. And then about three times a year they head out into the open ocean and run similar tests on the Scotian shelf. The brown stuff is phytoplankton? Or? The data we have on our oceans dates back and only decades and much of it has been collected sporadically. Paul Dickey wants the information he brings back to be more consistent. That means a lot more mornings on the basin. So I've got a comment that says, and you should have seen the one that got away. That reminds me to tell you this story. Uh, when Paul came back from one of his uh, regular Wednesday morning sampling trips, he came to my office and he said, Bill, you won't believe the one that got away. I said, Paul, what do you mean? Well, when I was out there sampling this morning, there was a big black elong elongated one that came right up to the surface and I didn't have a chance to put the net over it. And I say, Paul, what do you mean? <laughs> well, it turned out that that morning, the Navy was conducting sea exercises for its newly bought British class submarine. And one of them had surfaced <laughs> right next to a sampling vessel. <laughs> and they looked at him and said, what are you doing? So that one was the one that got away. Uh, time is very short here now, so I, I won't go through any of this, only to let you know that uh, we do have uh, a weekly monitoring in the basin that we measure temperature and plankton on. So if you're interested in any of that, uh, BIO has a website and you can check their data. So the final summary slide uh, to wrap all of this up is to say this. BIO is a federal government agency. And what we do is uh, uh, science for the public good. And so what I've tried to show you today is a case study in how phytoplankton research at BIO uh, is strategic science in the public interest developed through so many decades. In the early days, uh, we were doing foundational science. We needed to establish the foundations of our discipline uh, before doing uh, anything else. Then later, once uh, we have some of the pieces in place, we could really attack the problems uh, with a more rigorous approach, what we call hypothetical deductive science. And I showed you one example of that. Then beyond that, uh, once the science starts to mature, uh, we take that science and we do what Thomas Kuhn had told us is normal science. That is, um, it's the day-to-day -day hard grind of the science. Um, so, and it's technology driven. Uh, each new piece of technology opens up a new window into the science. So there's always new vistas to look at. Then, research and development soon gives way to operations and monitoring. It becomes routine. Uh, and much of uh, current day DFO stuff uh, done in the field uh, in biological oceanography is operations and monitoring. In fact, DFO in bureaucratic language, it becomes a non-research program with a sub, sub activity, which is aligned to department program architecture. And then beyond that, um, it becomes outsourced. Um, DFO science strategy moves R&D away from the in-house center to outsourcing and uh, the science becomes only so-called related science activities. Um, we who have worked at BIO are proud of the, this pathway we have taken uh, and uh, I hope to have shown you some of the um, uh, achievements that have led us 
from the early days to the present day. So before I offer our lucky door prize to some lucky attendee, I'd like to dedicate all this material I have presented to all my friends and colleagues um, who have now passed away. I also acknowledge much of the material to all the members of our team who have worked tirelessly over many years. And today, especially, I would like to thank Mike Haves or Havison, our audio engineer par extraordinaire, who have done so much uh, to help me uh, create these video clips. Uh, I also thank my two stalwart uh, friends here in the room, Rob Russell and John Stewart. Uh, to Barbara Cottrell. Uh, I was just wanting to thank you, Bill, for a fascinating look at our oceans and the work that is being done to keep us informed about them. You've certainly reminded us that it's the microscopic creatures that determine the changes in our ecosystem. It was amazing. And I will definitely look differently at the view from the bridge of the Bedford Institute when I go past now. So again, a very, very sincere thanks for an informative lecture. Before we go, I'd also like to thank Matt, Bob and John, our tech team, who do a lot of work to help us with bringing these lectures to you. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us today and to remind you to please go to the SCANS website and look at the terrific variety of courses that we're offering this spring. Thank you again for joining us and thank you, Bill. <laughs>